All right, let's go ahead and open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. As we continue our series here, 1 Corinthians 13. And the ushers do have a handout for you tonight once again. And uh, I do that so you pay attention, amen? Amen. Now, I, you guys are easy to preach to and wonderful to preach to, no doubt. I'm grateful. I'm going to begin reading verse 1. We'll read uh, the first uh, eight verses, right up to charity never faileth, and I've encouraged us to try to start memorizing this. Uh, and so we'll read it together when I say begin. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 8a, we'll call it, all right? Ready? Begin. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. We'll stop there. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness, and I pray as I preach the message you've led me to preach tonight that you'd help me. I need your help. We need your help to listen as well. I pray you'd fill me with your spirit. I pray that your word would go forth tonight with power and clarity, and that you would do the work that only you can do by your spirit, and that is to speak to our hearts and convict our hearts, we pray. So bless the message. Remove any distractions from our minds this evening and from this room, and we ask your blessing and help. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, tonight we're continuing with the series, as you notice on the top of your sheet, uh, that I've entitled to Love is to Live. And the idea of this series is this, for the believer. Now, when I say believer, I hope you know what I mean by that. Somebody that's saved. Somebody that's recognized one day that they were lost and on their way to hell and that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And they repented of their sin and trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's what it means to be saved. It's more than just uh, believing in God. Uh, It's more than just being religious. It's not trying to live a good life. It's putting your complete faith and trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ for your soul's salvation. And so for the believer, understand God's not done with us. As a matter of fact, he just started with us. Uh, For the believer, it's God's goal to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't resist that. Allow him to do it. Uh, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for them, that lo- for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for Amen. whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, watch this, to be conformed to the image of his son. That's right. you, that's me. One day when we get to heaven, we'll be like him. We won't right. be him, by the way. Amen. We'll be like him. Right. But all along the way, the Lord is trying to work in our hearts that he might make us like him as much as possible as here here on this earth. And that work that God is doing in our lives is known as, the biblical term is, progressive sanctification. That's what he's trying to do, growing more and more in our faith. Uh, adding biblical things into our lives that aren't there, that should be there, and then removing unbiblical things from our lives that are there, that shouldn't be there, thus becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to grow as a Christian, to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, kind of a sidebar here, if you don't mind me going down a path for a moment. I'm going to do it anyway, so just nod your hey, man. But anyway, some of the saddest things I think that you see as a pastor uh, in this area are three things. One is this, when somebody gets saved but never grows. That's sad. 
When someone comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and they don't, do not grow, uh, you know, it's easy to question someone like that, question their salvation. Did you really get it? Right. Are you really saved? Have you been born again? Because there is a change Amen. that God does in our lives when we get saved. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, right. he, is a, he is a new creature. Don't say he right. should be. Right. He is. God changes him. Old things are passed away. Right. Behold, all things are become new. So when someone gets saved and never grows, it's sad as a pastor to see that. Then I thought number two, when someone gets saved and has grown a little, if you will, but suddenly stops because they refuse to yield to the Lord in some area of their life. Uh, they're growing, they're saved and they're growing, but then they may hear something. They say, well, that, I'm not doing that. I mean, I did this and I did this for the Lord, but, but not that. And by the way, that happens with many Christians. Many of them, when there's an area in their life that they learn about, but they refuse to yield to the Lord in that area. It's kind of one of those hands-off Lord areas, you know. Uh, that's my area. It could be in the area of faithfulness to church services. Uh, it could be in the area of giving and finances. Don't touch that, Lord. Those are mine. I'll decide. I'm not going to let you decide. It could be in the area of dress uh, or music uh, or controlling your tongue uh, or forgiving others. Uh, some area where they say no to God. Now, they don't say that audibly, but they say it essentially by their actions. And their spiritual growth stops. You know, that happened in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. In John 6, 6, 6, Amen. the Bible says from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And that has been the story of many people that have come to know the Lord as their Savior. They're growing and growing, then all of a sudden they stop and they go back and they walk with him no more. That's a sad thing to see as a, as a pastor. As a Christian, Amen. it's a sad thing to see. Right. And then thirdly, when someone gets saved and they are faithful to serving the Lord, I mean, they are just sold out for God and just going for it, if you will, and then suddenly they stop uh, or they drift backwards, uh, leaving everybody perplexed. Like, what happened? Where's this person that was so on fire for the Lord Amen. Uh, that would go soul winning every Saturday and uh, hand out tracts and serve and, and deeply involved? And for some reason they stop. And so does their spiritual growth there as well. Right. Second Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved his, this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Uh, of course, Demas was serving the Lord right alongside of the Apostle Paul. Then all of a sudden, boom, he stopped. Why? Having loved this pre present world. Now, none of those things should be. Right. Uh, they shouldn't. Uh, we Amen. should all, all of us be steadily growing towards Christ likeness. Now certainly there's going to be setbacks along the way. That's part of the Christian life. Uh, but uh, we may be set back, but we never turn back. Amen. And we never right. quit. Uh, right. We continually move forward and get our hearts right with God Amen. along the way. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what Praise we're to do. We're to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the primary areas that we should all be growing is in this area that this series is about. It's in the area, area of love. Right. Charity is the biblical word, meaning God's agape love in action. In other words, uh, loving as he loved. Right. That's what God wants from us. Amen. He wants all of us to love as Jesus Christ loved. And by the way, in order to live as Christ lived, we must love as Christ loved. Right. Hence the title, to love is to live. But you know, the problem is that most Christians do not understand what biblical love is. What it means, because the world and the liberals, the new evangelicals, have hijacked the word. Like they've done with many other words. Uh, I was listening to a sermon by someone the other day. Not a good one either because it was from a church that once was a decent church that is just gone. 
and they got the band up there and the, the rock and roll going, CCM junk and the drums and all of that. And I can't tell you how many times, and you were there when we talked about this, how many times the pastor was up there and said, let's all worship together. Glad to have you here for worship. That's not worship. It's playing CCM music and raving your arms is not worship. It's not biblical worship. I'm going to go on a rabbit trail there. I better put the brakes on right about there. But, it, but it's, they've hijacked the word. By the way, they hijacked the phrase we dealt with on Sunday, judge not. Right. Well, that's in the Bible, but judge not. And you listen to the sermon if you want Amen. that clarity on that. Uh, so anyway, uh, to them, this to love is to overlook sin. Right. Right. To them, to love is to not call out wrongdoing. Right. Uh, to them, to love is to never get upset about anything. Well, tell that to the Lord Jesus Christ who overthrew the money changer uh, tables uh, right. and so forth in the temple. And what he said to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, how he preached to them. Uh, to them, love is just giving people whatever they want. You know, we're Christians after that. They want it. Let's just give it to them. That's not love. Amen. That's not biblical right. love. That's not how God loves. And that's not how Jesus Christ loved either. So the question is, how does he love? Good. Well, that's what this series is about. Now, remember, biblical love is so important. It's, it's a part of the fruit of the Spirit, isn't right. it? Amen. Galatians chapter 5. In Romans 5, it tells us it should be shed abroad in our hearts. In John 13, Jesus said it's the one thing that marks us as true disciples of Jesus Christ. So it's very, very important. Now, here in 1 Corinthians 13, we find the most comprehensive, in my opinion, explanation of charity, God's agape love in action in the Bible. Right. Here it is. It tells us what it is. It tells us what it does. Right. It tells us what it does not do. Right. It tells us how it does things and how it does not do things. It really describes, in my opinion, what I would say, God's perfect balance of grace and truth. We should never compromise the truth, Amen. but we should also have grace while we not compromise the truth. And that's what he desires in all of us. That's how Jesus Christ came. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And again, we need that balance, all of us do, that Amen. grace and truth. If we are going to bear the most fruit possible for the Lord Jesus Christ, we must have that balance of that. Amen. Now, from verses 4 to 7, we just read a moment ago, we find 14 characteristics, phrases, if you will, of charity. Beginning with two positive ones, we read in verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind. We've dealt with that. Followed by eight negative characteristics, most of which we've dealt with already. We'll deal with another one uh, tonight. We see that charity envieth not in verse 4. Here again, the negatives. Charity vaunteth not itself. Charity is not puffed up. Charity does not behave itself unseemly. Charity seeketh not her own. Charity is not easily provoked. And here it is, number seven of the eight negatives. We're going to deal with this one tonight. The Bible says that charity, here's a characteristic of it, it thinketh no evil. Amen. Charity thinketh Praise no the Lord. evil. And that's the title of the message tonight. Wow, that's real original, isn't it? Fancy title. Amen. Now, what does it mean? What exactly does this phrase mean? If you and I want to love as Jesus Christ loved, right. so we can live as Jesus Christ lived, we need to understand what does that phrase mean right. and why is that phrase important? Notice it's talking about our thinking. Charity thinketh no evil. Not talking about an action here. Right. It's talking about what's going on in your mind. Amen. So let's deal with that tonight. Notice number one, if you would please, the weight of our thinking. Amen. The weight. Now the Bible has a lot to say about the way a believer thinks. Right. How do you think? How am I thinking? Is that important? Absolutely. There are literally hundreds of verses in the Bible that deal with our minds. Amen. Our minds, how we think. 108 verses in the Bible mention the word mind or minds. Over 200 verses in the Bible use the words think or thinketh or thought or thoughts. And these verses, they instruct us on things like the kind of mind we are to have. Right. Instruct us on what to think, 
how to think and what not to think. And so the mind is a very important thing to understand biblically. I did a whole series on this before. I encourage you to get that. The battle in the mind is very helpful to myself Amen. and I think it'd be helpful to you as well. Now may I go as far as to say this tonight, that the primary battle that you and I face is in our minds. Right. You say, oh no, no, preacher, no, no. It's, it, it's my spouse. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's you. It's yourself. Right. Go a little deeper. It's not only you. It's, it's your mind. Right. What is going on in your mind? That's where the battle is. Right. Because how we think affects our walk with God. Right. How we think affects our service to God. Amen. How we think affects our attitude towards life. Amen. Our spirit, if you will. Our attitude towards people. Uh, how we think affects our mental health uh, and our physical health, which makes how we think a very, very important thing. Right. That's why we read in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, let this mind be in you Amen. that was in, also in Christ Jesus. First right. Corinthians 2, 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. That's the goal. Right. To have the thinking, to have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, three important truths about our thinking. Now, this first one's going to go against everything the world says. So if you get this one, you're going to leave here Amen. benefited. First one, number one, is this. Our thinking is controlled by us. Right. Well, I'd be a better Christian if this person... No, no, no. no. It's you. Amen. Our thinking is controlled by us. Us. Right. You see, the world, psychology, tries to make man a victim of his own mind. That's not true. Right. Matter of fact, the opposite is true. Right. The Bible clearly teaches us that we, are, we control our own thinking. Right. We're commanded in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, Common verse, most of us have it memorized. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue or if there be any praise, finish it with me. Think on these things. Think on these things. Why, I can't. I can't control it. Then why would he command it? Think on these things. Now, understand there are... Two primary ways, and these, this isn't in your notes, but two primary ways that thoughts enter into our minds. How? Number one is externally. We get information all the time, don't we? I mean, we're hearing stuff all the time. We hear things from other people, uh, things they say. We see things. We read things. We get information through news and the Internet, the radio, whatever you listen to. We even get suggestions from the devil, from Satan uh, externally. And we get truths from Scripture also. Are all affect our thinking, our thoughts. Uh, they're all sources that put thoughts into our minds right. and we're processing this throughout the day right. but it's not only coming from external sources coming from inside as well right. you say what do you mean by that internally there are things that you and I generate in our own minds right. thoughts right. Uh, some are from our past right. things that we remember uh, some from our perception of things. We internalize those and think those things. Uh, some from our own imaginations. We just think weird stuff. Right. I mean, we just think about stuff. Well, that's weird, you know. Uh, but, but understand something very important. What you and I dwell on, what we muse on, what we ruminate in our minds, ponder, or allow to settle in our minds uh, and, be, and become a part of our thinking is a matter of choice. It's a matter of choice. Amen. It's very important. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Watch this. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, this was the premise of that series I did before. 
But as we're seeing externally and internally all these thoughts going around, what we are to do, we are to test those thoughts by the scriptures, then we are to reject or refuse, or in biblical terminology of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, cast down any unbiblical thoughts, but receive into our minds and replace the bad thoughts with biblical thoughts. Amen. That's how we think right, thus producing biblical thinking. Right. You see, that's why it's very important to consider what you and I set before our eyes. That's good. Amen. Eh, it doesn't matter if I watch this. Yes, it does. Amen. You keep watching, watching, watching. It's going to affect you. Not me. Yes, you. Right. Yes, me too. We have to watch what we set before our eyes. We have to watch what we listen to, allow in our ears. Because if we allow again and again worldly ideas and worldly philosophies to ruminate there in our brains, it will affect our thinking. Amen. You see, my point is this. We can and do control our thinking. See, charity thinketh no evil. Well, I can't do that. It's just my... No, you can. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. So, first of all, uh, about our thinking, uh, letter A, our thinking is controlled by us. Then number, letter B, also, our thinking is known by God. Right. I, don't, I don't like that one. Anybody like that one? Yeah, you like that one, huh? Okay, well, we'll just plaster everything you're thinking right up here on the board or uh, on the screen, and we'll all look at that. That'd be embarrassing, wouldn't it, if every thought went up there? But guess what? God knows it. Every, we may not say it audibly, but when it's going on in our head, God knows. He knows what we're thinking. Right. Psalm 139, verses 1 and 2. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Amen. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Amen. God knows what we think. He knows how we're thinking. No one else may know it, but God, the Lord, does. I like what Hebrews 4.12 says. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Amen. So again, our thinking, letter A, is controlled by us. Letter B is known by God. And then letter three, or letter three, letter C, it, it affects our behavior. It does. Amen. How you and I think affects how we act. Right. Uh, Proverbs 23 and verse 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You see, what is going on in our minds, what it does, and I have a little chart there, but what it does, when you and I see things and we take things in, either externally or, or internally, we're thinking about things, and we allow those things to, we dwell on them, ponder, we allow them to ruminate in our hearts. Understand what that does. It, it, it generates emotions. Right. You know it and I know it, right? It stirs us up. Uh, or whatever, and those emotions produce attitudes, and those attitudes drive our behavior, and it all can be traced back to how we're thinking. Right. We behave a certain way because we're thinking a certain way. Our actions, what we do, and what we say is all a result of what we or and how we are thinking, and by the way, those things affect our relationships with other people. Right. So how we behave, again, is a direct product of our thinking. What we truly believe affects how we behave. And I say truly believe because many times we'll, we'll nod our head at something, you know, a, a sermon we hear or a truth. And, oh, yeah, Sunday school. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. And we go out and we just do the opposite of that. Well, that's because we don't truly believe it. Right. We, we may give mental assent to it, but you want to know what you truly believe? Don't only listen to what I say or you say. Go watch how the person lives. That'll show you how we truly believe. Because again, uh, what, we, what we truly believe affects our behavior. Matthew 15, 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. 
So my point is this, controlling our thinking is possible and very important because it affects our behavior. Our thinking is a very weighty thing. Right. So we see, number one, the weight of our thinking. Number two, write this down if you would, the warning about our thinking. So back to our text, notice we're, we're now talking about a specific type of thinking. Not about just all thinking, we're talking about specifically, we are told that charity, God's love, God's agape love in action, watch this, thinketh no evil. Right. Uh, there's a warning there, if you don't mind me saying it that way. The warning is this, don't think evil. Right. Don't think evil, because you're not showing God's, Christ's love. Amen. So, question is, what does it mean to think evil? Right. Now, is this talking about having sinful thoughts? Uh, no, it's, it's not. Is it talking about having evil temptations in your mind? In your mind? No, no. Now, although that's the Bible truth, we could do a whole sermon about that, that we, we should not have sinful thoughts. We should deal with that. But it's not talking about that here. In its context here, this, and this thinking evil means this. It means, notice I wrote it down at the bottom of your sheet, imputing evil upon others without just grounds. I'll say it again. Imputing evil upon others without just grounds. Grounds. Let me put it this way. Maybe we'll, we'll get it. Thinking the worst instead of the best. Right. Always thinking the worst about someone. Assuming evil things about others without, and this is the key here, without a, any real justification. It's always assuming the worst about things with no reason to do so. The Bible is telling us here that God's love, Christ's love, agape love, charity, does not do this. Right. We do not always assume the worst in people for no reason. Right. We don't think the worst uh, instead of the best without justification. Right. Bible commentator Adam Clark, I like the way he said this, so I, I thought I'd read it. He says this, thinketh no evil, Believes no evil where no evil seems. In other words, there's no justification for it. He says it never supposes that a good action may have a bad motive. Keyword supposes. It gives every man credit for his profession of religion, uprightness, godly zeal, when nothing is seen in his conduct or in his spirit that is inconsistent with this profession. Uh, he, our heart is so governed and influenced by the love of Christ that we cannot think of evil but where it appears. In other words, if there is no evidence of evil, then don't assume it. Right. Uh, don't assume that every good deed has a bad motive. Right. Uh, with, if there's no evidence, don't accuse somebody of wrongdoing. Don't think ill of someone when the only wrongdoing is in your mind. Uh, don't act like you know something that you really don't know because you're just assuming things that aren't there. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about not assuming evil. Now, there's a good Bible example of this. We could go there. Let's just do it. We got till midnight. So Joshua chapter 22 I got a couple amens there. I don't know if I would have amen there myself. You remember this story, right? The altar of Ed, right? When the two and a half tribe, Joshua 22, when uh, uh, Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, they wanted the land on the east side Jordan River. Moses said, no, you got to go and fight. Uh, and then when you fight and they get settled in, then you can come back and have it because uh, you can't sit here while your brethren are fighting. And so all that took place. They did go into the promised land with them, Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. And they fought with Jericho, Jericho and all those things. And now it was time. The tribes were settled there in the land. Now it's time for them to come back and, and go inherit the land on the east side of the Jordan River. And so they did. So they waved goodbye to their brethren, Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, and they left. And, and of course, the two and a half tribes, as they were going, before they, uh, when they were at the Jordan River, they decided to build an altar. Right. And the children of Israel on the west side of the Jordan heard that. Right. 
And they thought they assumed evil right. about what they were doing. Right. Let's look at it in verse 10. And notice, and when they came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see. And the children of uh, Israel, where are we at here? Uh, heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of Israel, of the children of Israel, gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against him. Why? Because they thought evil. Long story short, they thought that they were starting to worship idols. And starting to worship a different God. And so they gathered everybody together. And they're going to go, let's go destroy them right now. Right. But before they did, they did something smart. They decided to go check it out. And they went and talked to them. And really, the opposite was true. Amen. They said, we're not trying to separate from you guys. Matter of fact, we made that altar to show people we're connected with you guys. Right. To show them that we have the same God that you have. That we worship the same God of Jehovah. Uh, we're not doing it for ill reasons. Uh, right. We had good intents uh, behind it. Uh, but again, it could have been an all-out war if they kept going in their evil intent thoughts. Right. But they didn't. Look at verse 16. Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord, and that ye have builded you an altar that ye might rebel this day uh, against the Lord? And we could go on, and I told you the rest of the story. That's not what was happening. But again, what happened here? Love thinketh no evil. They thought evil. By the way, it's easy for all of us to do that. I might even go as far to say that we all do that sometimes. Right. We just assume things bad that we have no reason to assume. Not I remember years ago we had a church member, no longer here, the whole, everybody involved in this story is not here, so don't try to figure it out. But uh, we had a church member come through the church building and uh, had seen one of our staff members on a, on a computer. And uh, came back a little bit later in the day, and the, the staff member was on the computer. And the church member came to me and said this, well, so-and-so doesn't do anything about here but sit around and play on that computer all day. I said, oh, really? Well, guess what? I found out something. He was doing work on the computer all day. He wasn't playing around all day. See, there, there, there's that thought uh, there that was there. That was thinking, thinking evil. And by the way, when you see someone on the phone, on their phone or, or on their computer, uh, you can't automatically think with no grounds that, uh, well, look at them. They're addicted to video games. You can't automatically say that. Uh, or, or oh, they must be, they're listening to bad music. Uh, or, or they must have a pornography problem. They're on their phone all day. Or they're on a dating site, or they have a, maybe they have some secret rela relationship with someone. You cannot, you cannot, without grounds, assume those things, right. because that's exactly what this is trying to prohibit in 1 Corinthians 13, when it says, love thinketh no evil. Amen. You know, you ever have somebody you just have a conversation with, and they just kind of communicate in a different way than you do? Um. You know, we are supposed to communicate with words, right? right? I say something, you say something. Right. But there are some people that don't operate that way. In other words, they hear what you're saying, but they think, well, they mean something else. And they try to read between the lines of stuff that everybody says. That's a hard person to deal with. I'm not right. thinking of anybody. I don't know who he's thinking of. I'm not thinking of anybody. I'm really not. Right. I'm not. I'm not. But you ever have somebody like that? You, you know, someone say, say something about you. Well, what gives you the grounds to say that? Well, I don't know. I just, I'm just thinking that. Well, then you're thinking evil. That's, you have no grounds. And, and that's not how we're, we're to operate. Uh, and uh, some people like to say this. So they say, you don't understand, preacher. You, you don't understand. You see, they say, I have the gift of discernment. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I can just... Uh, I can just tell when somebody's up to no good. I have that gift. Well, I hate to burst your bubble. No, you don't. Right. And you can't. Amen. 
Not if you don't have any evidence. Right. If you're just assuming things, you don't have no gift of discernment. Amen. As a matter of fact, you're thinking evil. Right. Now let me throw this uh, here, this uh, caveat, if you would. If there are grounds, that's a different story to right. think away. Uh, uh, if they have a guilty look on their face, you know, or, or if they're trying to hide what they're doing, like they're doing something on the phone, and you come in, they, they stuff the phone in their pocket. You know, that, that's evidence. Uh, or if they uh, repeatedly re re erase their history on their computer, or they have secret apps, those apps that vanish away, or, or, or again, uh, every time you walk in the room, they turn the computer on. That's a different story. I'm not talking about that. Right. I'm talking about when, when, when just thinking evil for absolutely no reason, the Bible calls that evil surmising. Right. That's not a good thing to do. And it's definitely not the love of Christ. Right. First Timothy 6, 3 talks about that. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, notice he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. There it is. And charity does not do that. Amen. It thinketh. No evil. That's a warning from God. Stop assuming things about people without any justification. Stop just making up stuff in your mind. It's not good. Which brings us to point three, the woes of thinking evil. The woes, W-O-E-S. You see, thinking evil, we're taking the opposite of that. Love thinketh no evil. So thinking evil or evil surmising is not only not God's love, there's a double negative for you, but it's very damaging to people. Right. It's very damaging if you're the type of person that you think everybody has some secret life and you have no ground to think that way. Right. It's damaging to you and it's damaging to everybody around you. Now, let's talk about that. Two things thinking evil does. Letter A is this. Write this down. It prohibits healthy relationships. Right. You can't have a relationship if you think everybody has an ulterior motive. Right. Here, I have a birthday card for you. I wonder what they want. <laughs> wonder what they're after. That's not a good thing. You can't have a relationship. See, relationships are built on trust. If you don't have trust, you don't have a relationship. Right. By the way, that's how we get saved and enter into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. We trust Jesus Christ as Savior, right? right? So relationships are built on trust. Proverbs 3, 5, uh, uh, trust in the Lord with all thine heart Amen. and lean not unto thine own understanding. We have a relationship with him because we trust him. We have a relationship with people. It's, bu it's built and based on trust. But when somebody routinely accuses you of something that you have not done, trust cannot be built. Right. Feelings get hurt, and there is no oneness and unity in the relationship. Right. You know, I feel sorry for a person that lives life that way, thinking that everybody's, you know, got something, and they, they know all that. Because if that's you, you're not going to have many friends. You're not. Uh, you're not gonna. Uh, you're not gonna be liked by many people, and you're not gonna like many people, because you're gonna think everybody's got something going, right. and you're gonna end up just a, a grumpy and grouchy old Christian right. that nobody wants to be around, right. because you, on your self-righteous pedestal, look down upon everyone like you're perfect, and everybody else got something wrong. Be careful, because right. that's what that leads to Amen. when you think evil of people. Right. So it prohibits healthy relationships. And then letter B, it also produces discord. Right. You know, most of the time when people think evil of others, they don't keep it to themselves. Right. They don't just think of it and just right. sit on it. They like to share. Right. They like to share with others. They do. They tell others about what they think. And so what do they do? They share their evil surmisings about people with people. They share their suspicions about people with others. What does that do? It causes other people to have doubts about that person as well, hence promoting discord amongst right. people. God help us. 
Listen, we have enough battles out there in the world. Amen. We do. Right. We don't want them in here. Right. We shouldn't have them in here. Right. This should be a time of encouraging one another. Amen. This should be time of blessing one another, if you will. Uh, not to, uh, trying to pick uh, everything right. apart and so forth, producing that, that discord, because that is evil. You know, one of the things the Lord hates, Proverbs 6, 19, these Amen. six things does the Lord hate, and seven is an abomination to him. A false witness that speaketh lies, uh, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. God hates that. And so if you're the type of person that's always assuming things about everybody and you share that with people, that's exactly what you're doing. Amen. And God hates it. God help he hates it. Right. Listen, let's, let's pause here and remember something. What is our goal as believers? Our Amen. goal as a church and as believers is to reach people with the gospel. Right. We're not trying to lose people. We're trying to build people. Amen. We're not trying to kick people out. We're trying to restore people. Amen. And so we're trying to reach them. We're trying to encourage one another. You know, there's people sitting in this auditorium. They've been working all day, perhaps got very little sleep, shoved a sandwich down their mouth, and came to church and trying to get something from God. Amen. And they're tired, but they're here. Praise the Lord for that. Let's encourage them. Amen. We're looking right. up sleeping in service. He was probably on the internet all night looking at pornography. Come on now. Now that's extreme, but I'm just saying, let's not evil surmise. Amen. We're trying to make a difference. Thinking evil will do just the opposite of that. Right. And then number four, and we're done right here, the way of thinking no evil. So, so how, do we, how do we stop from doing this? You say, well, preacher, I can't help it. That's just me. I got that gift of discernment. That's just the way I think. Should I go back to point number one and say again how you can control your thinking? You, that's why I spent the whole time on that. You can control your thinking. Here's some things that will help you and help me think no evil. Letter A, write this down. Uh, separate facts from fallacy or fantasy. Listen, if, there are, if there's no evidences of wrongdoing... If, if there's no facts of wrongdoing, uh, if there's no bona fide, tangible, valid reason, and there could be, but if there's not to believe that something's wrong, uh, then, then don't automatically assume it. Right. Make your decisions and base your thinking on facts, right. not the fancies of your mind and your imagination. Amen. Uh, again, if there's nothing, don't automatically assume evil. It's interesting in Deuteronomy, let me just read this verse real quick. In chapter 17, when it's talking about the judges, uh, and they're talking about when you bring someone and there's an accusation, right. it, it goes on to say this. Uh, it says, uh, and hath gone, this person, and, and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded. And it be told thee... And thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain, that such an abomination is wrought in Israel, then shalt thou bring forth that man or woman, and, and again, do what they have to do with them. Right. My point is this, they didn't just hear something and go with it. Uh, they inquired, they heard, inquired diligently, and made sure it was true before they made that conclusion. So separate facts from fantasy. Letter B, don't become cynical. Right. Now here's what happens. I heard this. I heard someone say this, so I won't take credit for it, but I like it. You know, as we get older, and you get older in the Christian life, you see more and more people fall. Right. And uh, I remember when I would, had first gotten saved and I got involved with uh, uh, going on staff at the Bible college and... Uh, and I was made first, I was the assistant dean of students my first year. And then my second year, I was the dean of students. And you know what that means, right? That means you deal with all the junk. Okay, you're the demerit guy, you know? And you got to deal with others, but you, uh, all this wrongdoing. And I remember when I, when I, you know, and I was, you know, I was older, but you know, I hadn't been saved for 20 years. And when I was hearing some of the things that the Christian students were doing, I like to fall off the chair. I literally went home crying some days. I did. I said, I can't, this is so bad. I can't believe it. 
But it's, that's, that's what happens sometimes when people turn their back on God. They get, they get involved with it. And as you get older, you see it more people and more people. That some of you never thought were going to fall. fall. God, God help us, not, none of us to fall. But, but again, it happens. And, and you, you as a believer, you get hurt again and again and again from people. And many times from the people you try to help the most. And then you start to begin to think, well, everybody's got something they're hiding, I think. Everybody. That's not true. Right. Amen. That's not true. Right. I truly believe that this room, most of this room, is filled with people that are trying to live the Christian life and trying to be right with God. I really right. believe that. Amen. Uh, I, I wish I could say everybody. I don't know. I'm not referring to anybody. But my, my, my point is this. After a while, you can become cynical. You can always see the bad in everything and everybody. And it makes the Christian life miserable if you're not careful. Right. When you start thinking evil and assuming things, be careful. Amen. It's very, very, very damaging. Uh, make sure you don't become... I, I, again, uh, by the way, uh, you, you think, well, it's just a matter of time till we find out. So uh, stop. Just stop. If there's no evidence, just leave it alone. Philippians 1.3. You know what Paul said about the, uh, the people, the church of Philippi? He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Amen. You know what he was doing? He was controlling his thinking. Amen. You don't think there were some people there that rubbed them the wrong way or, you know, there weren't some issues. Sure there was. Every church there is. But he, th he wanted to think, no, he, if there was no evidence of that, he wasn't assuming things, Amen. I have great thoughts of you. Be fair to people. Amen. Just because they're a person, don't think right. there's automatically a secret life. And the letter C, and we're done right here. The last one, the most important one, is have faith in God. Right. Amen. Do you know if, if somebody is doing wrong and you don't see it, guess what? God will take care of it. Right. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to be the one that's going to say, well, I'll have to, I'm going to make sure everybody knows and this and that. No. If someone is doing wrong, God will deal with it. Uh, by the way, he does a much better job at it than we do. Amen. And again, if we see something that's totally different, but if there's nothing there, please don't go assume wrong about people. Right. Because it's going to cause discord Amen. and do damage to the cause of Christ. So the question is, are you somebody that habitually thinks the worst when there's no grounds? Right. Assume things with no justification? That's not Christ's love. Right. Love thinketh Amen. no evil.